unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Luke chapter 4 from verses 31. The Bible says, Jesus came down to Copernicus, the Bible says, a city of Galilee, and taught men on the Sabbath. And the Bible says that they were astonished at his doctrine, or his word, the Bible says, was with power. And in the synagogue, there was a man which had a spirit, an unclean spirit, or an unclean devil, and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Had thou come to destroy us, I know thee who thou art, and the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked the devil, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And the 36th verse says, And they were all amazed, and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they came out, or they come out. This, for me, is one of the most revealing experiences of what the life of salvation represents, what the life of Christianity represents. Jesus enters a synagogue, and he starts to teach on the Sabbath in Capernaum. And as he's teaching, there's something remarkable happening around his teaching, and that is that they are astonished at his doctrine. They find that his teaching is unusual. Why was his teaching unusual? The Bible says his word was with power. His word was with power. His word was with power. In fact, in one part of the Gospels, in Matthew chapter 7, 28, it gives us the difference between the ministry of Jesus and any other teacher of his time. The Bible says it came to pass that when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. The Bible says, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The difference between Jesus Christ and the rest of the people that were teaching in his day, the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Essenes. And this was the difference. But when Jesus taught, there was an authority that came behind the man's doctrine. He was not speaking of his own. He was not simply saying words that were powerless. The Bible says they were astonished at the authority of his words. He was not just a wonderful teacher. He was not just a persuasive tongue. He was not just a convincing voice. He was a man with a certain authority behind his voice. There was something about his words. There was something about his articulation. There was something about his expression that caught the eyes of those that surrounded him. And it's on such a day as he's speaking, and the power of God is available, that a demon spirit manifests through one fellow. He's saying, what do you want with us? We know that you are Christ. We know that you are Lord. Hushes the devils and tells them, come out. And when he casts the devils out, the Bible says, people are again amazed. The Bible says, what a word is this? For with authority, the Bible says, and power, he has commanded the unclean spirits, and they've come out. Jesus, when he walked the surface of this earth, the life that he lived, the things that he did, set a certain principle, a certain way of life for the believer that now is. Jesus set a certain standard for ministry. He set a certain standard for the gospel. He set a certain standard for the message. And this was the standard, that he never spoke a word without a certain authority. 
You know, there's a difference between being gifted and speaking in a certain authority. They look like they're similar, but at one particular point, these ideas start to vary as you continue understanding the way of the Spirit. Not all gifted people need to say anything for them to function in the gift with which God has given them. In fact, you can lay a hand on a sick person and they're delivered without you saying a word with your mouth. It's possible. The Bible says they laid the sick at the shadow of Peter, but adventure he might pass them. And the Bible says as they laid the sick on the shadow of Peter, they were healed. That mean that as he was walking through, he was speaking and rebuking. No, 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 no. There's a place where you don't even need to say much because your spirit has a certain command. But I want to also talk about the issue of the authority of our words, the authority of the words for the New Testament believer, for you and I that is listening to me, because the Bible says we shall be judged for every idle word that is spoken. And sometimes people think idle words are simply words that do not carry any sense. But sometimes we can speak so meaningful words, but without a certain authority to these words. The difference between Jesus and the religious zealots of his time was that there was a certain authority that came through his words. There was a certain glory that came through his doctrine that made him a different fellow, you know. And once God gives you a certain authority, you stop speaking to minds. You stop speaking to minds. You start speaking to hearts. You start communicating to spirits in a more unique way. There's something about the authority of the language of the spirit. There's something about speaking in the authority of God. It's, it's, it's just so redefining. And tonight I want to touch that area because if many of us don't understand how this works, we'll live a very powerless life, yet we're believers. And I have known many people, believers out there, who confess and make all kinds of confessions. In fact, if you hear them and you're just new in the faith, you could even run away from them because those confessions are crazy. They are big, you know, they are ginormous, they are humongous, they are scary, they're scary big, they're scary sounding bold, but they never carry the effect and the power and the authority with which these people speak. And yet, they even quote the scriptures. It's possible for us to speak the word of God, but without the effect of that word on our lives. We've seen experiences before in scripture where the word of God is void of its power, okay? Meaning that every word that is spoken of God is supposed to have a certain power and authority behind it. And this is the thing that astonishes the people in Jesus' time. Now, if I want to delve a bit deeper into teaching this, so for us to understand this, if we go back to the verses 32, the word used for his word is logos, okay? Not rema, logos, okay? And what is logos? Logos is divine expression. If I have to define what logos is, logos is divine expression. You know, our divine nature has a certain expression. Our divine nature has a certain speech. Our divine nature has a certain utterance. That is logos. The entirety of God's word. You know, that's Logos. And so when the Bible says they were astonished at his doctrine, for his Logos was with power, it means his divine expression had power. Every believer must have a divine expression. There's a way people in the world express themselves. When we become born again, we obtain a certain expression. It might not be seen with the physical eyes, but it has effects in the spirit realm. And yet, if it has effects in the spirit realm, it will have manifestation in the physical realm, of course. For all the things that we see were made or are brought about by things which are not seen. For the things which are not seen bring about the things which we see. Okay? And so when I say that every believer must have a divine expression, your divine expression is the entirety of the word of God, Logos. It's your utterance. It's what God has placed inside you when you received him. The word is nigh thee. It is in thine mouth. Okay, in the beginning was the word, Logos. And the word was with God. And the same was in the beginning with God. 
Who is that? Logos. And nothing that is made was made without him. For in him, the Bible says, was life. And life was the light of men. Okay? And the light shines in darkness, and darkness comprehendeth him not. And the Bible says, and Logos became flesh and dwelt among us, among men. And the Bible says, and we beheld his only glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who was that? Logos. This is Christ in the flesh, the word in the flesh. So when we're talking about this word, we're talking about Logos, okay? Christ is one with the word. He and the word are the same. They are one and the same. He is the word of the living God. And so the Bible says his Logos, his divine expression, his divine expression as the person of Christ, the Bible says, had power. It had power. Now, the word there for power is exousia, all right? Authority. Now, when we're talking about authority, and you'll allow me to go a bit deep here to explain this, there are two kinds of authority explained in Scripture, okay? When you open Titus chapter 2, verses 15, the Bible says, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Now, the Greek word there for authority is epitage. Epitage. It means with mandate. It means with command. It means with injunction. Okay? So it says, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with mandate. Rebuke as one who has the mandate to, who has been commanded to do that. It's different from exousia. The authority of exousia is not the authority of epitage. Epitage is just mandate and command. Exousia goes a bit deeper than that. And what is exousia? Exousia is the liberty of the Spirit, the right given to you by the person of the Holy Spirit to be able to command and speak by choice in the Spirit. That's exousia. It's more than just right. It comes with a certain liberty. The liberty of the Spirit is in the realm of exousia. Epitage, Titus 2.12, that does not necessarily come with the liberty to speak because they're telling the man to speak as he has been commanded to speak, all right? But when it comes to exousia, it gives a liberty of spirit. It's as though even what is spoken is birthed from the man's liberty with which he has been given that opportunity through Christ. It's that place that gives the man the power of choice. The power of choice. To choose to determine the forms and elements and things of the spirit. That is authority. That is the authority I'm talking about. That is exousia. It is the power of influence. The power to influence a thing in the spirit realm. The power to tilt things to your favor in the spirit realm. That is exousia. That's the kind of authority I'm talking about. The liberty to choose a course in the spirit realm. That is exousia that I'm talking about. Now, when we're talking about dunamis, the other definition of power, there are two kinds of power, exousia and dunamis. When we're talking about dunamis, we're talking about the power that makes exousia possible, all right? That helps in the execution, the manifestation, the physical manifestation of exousia, of that liberty in the spirit. Because I have liberty in the spirit. I have the power of influence in the spirit. But how do I translate that into the physical realm for manifestation? That is dunamis. All right? So when we go to the 36th verse, I believe, when he rebukes the devil and then the demons flee, the Bible says they ask themselves, what a word is this? For with authority, that is exousia, and power, dunamis, he commandeth the unclean spirit and they come out. In other words, he both has the liberty of the spirit the influence of the spirit, the right of the spirit, and the power that makes the physical possible in manifestation to cast out any devil. He has both the spiritual and the ability to manifest the spiritual. Dunamis is the ability to manifest the spiritual. Exousia is the liberty to express the spiritual, the power to influence the spiritual. You see that? And so they were astonished at his word. Why? Because his word was with power. His word was with power. But when we go into, again, let me go deeper, a bit into exousia, so you understand me a bit deeper. When I was studying that word, I realized that in the root 
definition of exousia. There's also a likeness of a husband's authority over his wife. The likeness of a husband's authority over his wife. It is the veil which uh, property required women of old to be covered of themselves because they were submitted to their husbands, all right? So when we're talking about exousia, it's likened to the relationship that a husband has over his wife and the submission of that wife to the husband. And I'm going to make this a bit more interesting in a few minutes so you'll understand this. When the Bible speaks in Ephesians chapter 5, when it says that for this reason, Solomon leave his father's household, the Bible says, and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife. And the Bible says, and the two shall become one flesh. All right. And the Bible says, for this, he says, is a great mystery. All right. For this is a great mystery mystery. Why? Because he speaks concerning Christ and the church. He speaks concerning Christ and the church. The authority that Christ has over the church. The church is a submitted entity to Christ, yet the church is one with Christ. Now, if I have to explain to you how exosia works, Allow me to explain this also in this allegory of husband and wife, because when Christ is speaking about husband and wife in Scripture, he also brings that expression of the great mystery, which is Christ and the church, the groom and the bride. He likens that relationship because we are married to Christ. We are one with Christ. Right? Now, let's see how that authority connects to our relationship with Christ. Let's see how we as a bride, the church as a bride, and Christ as a groom, how that authority connects to this person of Christ, to this relationship between man and woman, Christ and the church. If you'll open with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 5, Paul says a very fundamental statement, and I'm going to read from verse 5 up to probably verse 12 so I can explain that. Now, Wherever you see man in this scripture, I want you to put Christ, okay? And wherever we will see woman in the scripture, for the most part of it, we will put the church. And I want to go with you on this journey so you can connect what I'm trying to explain to you. I want to show you the power of exosia. I want to show you the power of how this authority uh, works in your life. Now, the Bible says in verses 5, But every woman that prays, or prophesieth, all right, with her head uncovered, the Bible says, dishonoreth her head. Dishonoreth her head. Now again, I told you, remove woman and put the church, okay? And Paul fundamentally here is telling us that if the church of Jesus Christ prays or prophesies, and what is prophecy? To speak forth the oracles of God, prophesies with their head uncovered, right? They dishonor their head. The church dishonors its head, okay? It dishonors its head, all right? What do we mean when we say head uncovered? It means it is not submitted to the authority of the person of Christ, all right? He says, for that is even all one as if she were shaven, all right? In other words, you imagine a woman shaven bald. In the Old Testament dispensation in Jewish culture, it was an abomination to shave a woman bald. Of course, today, you know, it's fashion. But back in those days, to shave bald was wrong. Why? Because it is believed from Jewish culture that a woman's hair is her glory. Okay? This is her glory. You know, so imagine in the Jewish culture, to shave off, it means that there was no regard for that woman's glory. There was no regard for the glory on her that makes her a woman, okay? It was one of those things that defined who a woman was. Today it might not, but then it was, okay? Now, he continues to say in verse 6, For if the woman be not covered, all right, if she carries no authority above her, if the church does not have an authority above her, the Bible says, so let her be shown. In other words, it means, then let the church lose its glory. 
There's no point to say that the church can have a glory without an authority above it, and that is Christ. And now he continues to say, but if it be a shame for a woman to be shown or shaven, let her be covered. In other words, if without glory, without this hair, it is a shaming, then it is expedient that a woman be covered. All right, that the church carries a certain authority over her because the absence of an authority over the church means the absence of the glory of God. And the absence of the glory of God means that we will be put to shame. It means you will pray and it will not work. You'll be ashamed. It means you will believe and it will not work. You'll be ashamed. Let's continue. Verse 7 says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Here they're talking about Christ. That Christ does not need to cover his head. Why? For as much as he is the image and the glory of God. Now the Bible calls Christ the express image of the invisible God. Okay? The express image of the invisible God. All right? Now, these three are one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible continues to say, But the woman is the glory of man. The church is the glory of Christ. All right? And it continues to say, For the man, Christ, is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. Give me the Amplified of that in verses 8. He says, For the man was not created from woman, but woman from man. That's what the Amplified says. For man was not created from woman, but woman from man. All right? In other words, Christ was not created from the church, but rather the church was created from Christ. Okay? We are God's workmanship. The Bible says, created in Christ Jesus, that we might show forth the praises of him that called us to glory and virtue. You see, we came out of Christ. Christ did not come out of the church. The church came out of Christ. So, verses 9, neither was man created on account for or for the benefit of woman. All right? But woman on account of and for the benefit of man. All right? We were created for Christ. Okay, verses 10, he says, therefore, should she be subject, she should be, the church, wife, should be subject to his authority and should have a covering on her head as a token, a symbol of her submission to authority that she may show reverence as do the angels and not displease them. In other words, when a woman is disobedient to her head, the Bible says she displeases the angelics. Okay, now remove woman again and put church. Okay, so the Bible says that if the church is not submissive, okay, and to cover itself by recognizing the authority of the person of Christ as a symbol of her submission to that authority, if she cannot do that, if she cannot yield and subject herself to the authority of Christ as her cover, the Bible says that displeases the angelics. That means that the angelic ministry on our lives, even as the church is frustrated when we are not submitted under the authority of the person of Christ. Remember, we began husband, wife. Now we're getting into the place of church and Christ. Now, that authority I'm trying to explain is exosia. It's exosia. All right? It's exosia. And I'll connect it to help some of us understand where I'm going. And let's continue in verses 11. He said, nevertheless, the KJV says that neither is the man without woman, right? Neither the woman without the man in the Lord, all right? If you have to take this Christ and the church, Christ is not separated from the church in God. And the church is not separated from Christ in God. Remember his prayer in John 17 that they might be in me and I in you, that we might be one, that the world will know that I have loved them. Okay? That's the proof that we have been loved by God because we are in Christ and Christ is in God. So Christ is not without the church in God and neither is the church without Christ in God. It's going to take many people a long time to finally understand that we cannot continue preaching a message that separates men from Christ. There are people who go in the presence of God and they feel as though they are not one 
with Christ. They're not in Christ. They're not espoused to him. The church has been betrothed to Jesus Christ. Your prayer life will change the day you understand that you're not praying alone. You have an authority. You have an authority. You have an authority. Your life will change when you say, Father, I speak healing. You're not speaking it alone. There is an authority behind that is backing the identity of your words, the glory of your words. When we start defining faith, it is that place where our spirits are aligned to the reality of the authority with which we speak the word of God. The word of God is not alone. You cannot say in the name of Jesus and something does not happen. Oh, you can tell me I did it, but it did not work. It did not work because you did not know the things I'm trying to explain to you now. You were no longer of your own when you became born again. You cease to be of your own when you became born again. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are not a Christian praying alone to Jesus to hear you. He spoke one in the scripture and said, in that day you shall ask me nothing. Why? Because the Father loves you even as he has loved me. This is Jesus speaking. He says, in that day you will not ask me of anything, but whatsoever you shall ask in my name, it shall be given to you. It shall be done unto you that the Father may be glorified because it's the glory of the Father to fulfill the desires of the Son. You, as a believer, you are one with Christ. That's why the Bible says we are the body. He's the head and we are the body. So no believer should speak words without the authority of the Spirit. How do we heal the sick? We heal the sick by the continuous exercising of our consciences to connect to the authority with which we speak. We don't speak alone. When you understand that, even if you don't say in the name of Jesus, the miracle will happen. Because it's not just about saying in the name of Jesus, but it's about having a relationship in that name having a revelation of that name. One time I was somewhere and uh, I was in a meeting and I cast out a devil out of somebody. I said, go. And when I said go, it screamed out and left. And then an old lady came and said, why didn't you say in the name of Jesus? She asked me, why didn't you say in the name of Jesus? If you did not say in the name of Jesus, under what authority do you cast out the devils if you didn't say in the name of Jesus? So I asked her, the girl who had the devil was with you in your presence. Why didn't you say in the name of Jesus? I was trying to ask her, why didn't you say to that devil around that girl that in the name of Jesus go? I was trying to help her understand, this woman understand, that it's more than just Jesus. There are people in the world called Jesus. If you go to Brazil, there are people called Jesus. Jesus. What did I mean that if I call him Jesus, a player, a physical person, Jesus, that means there'll be effect when I call that person's name. There's a difference between the Jesuses of this world, the ones that have existed even before, and the one I'm talking about. This one of Nazareth has a record. He has a story. He has a testimony with him. He knew no sin and became sin. All right? He humbled himself even as unto the cross, the Bible says. And the Bible says, and he went in hell. He shook them or not. He shook all the powers and he disarmed the principalities, that Jesus I'm talking about. And he got the keys of death from the devil. The Bible says he returned from hell in glory. That one, he was given a name. Because he obeyed to death. He was given a name. The Bible says that at the sound of that name, every knee bows of the things in the earth, of the things under earth, and of the things in heaven. And every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. That one who was given authority. When we have a relationship with that name, when we have a revelation in that name and a relationship in that name, okay, it's more than just saying Jesus. 
No, it's bigger than that. I can find a person possessed by a devil and I say, get out. And the devil would know that I've come in that name. Why? To say whoever shall call on the name is to connect with that name in revelation and relationship. There are people who have a relationship but without a certain revelation of it. And there are people who claim a revelation but without the relationship of that name. So there are people who are still struggling with that. It's more than just Jesus. It's deeper than that. It's the essence of that name. It's the nature of that name. It's what that name identifies with in the spirit realm. When a man connects it in that revelation, there are many people out there who are screaming Jesus and they're going to die. They are in trouble, deep trouble. And the Bible says, if you call on the name of Jesus, you shall be saved. But there are people right now who are out there in trouble, all sorts of trouble. They are sick. Their finances are going. Their marriages are failing. They have sick people around them. And they are calling on that name, but they will not see the results of that name. Why? Because they don't have a certain revelation in that name. There are even those who say, no, you have to call him Yeshua. If you don't call him Yeshua, then you're calling another one. Listen, for some of us, Jesus met us even before we understood that he was a Jew. I met Jesus in a vision at the age of eight. I had not known what was Jew and what was Gentile. They just spoke of a man who shed his blood for my sins. And as I was confessing Jesus Christ, he appeared in a vision to me before I even knew him anyway. And when I saw him in a vision, I knew that this was Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about people to whom Satan has appeared and they think that's Jesus. I'm talking about people who have really had an experience of the visitation of Jesus Christ. If anybody has seen the Lord Jesus, they will know that he does not need to introduce himself. There's something about the glory of his person that brings the understanding to the individual at that hour that he's in contact with a power that is bigger than them and that is Jesus. You remember Paul, you know, on his way to Damascus to persecute the church, when that bright light shines, you know, at midday. The scriptures say, when he says, Saul, Saul, he says, who are you, Lord? He's saying, Lord, he knew that there was a lordship to this person that was calling. It wasn't just any other spirit. There was a uniqueness to this lordship. He says, who are you, Lord? He says, who art thou, Lord? Okay, and the Lord says, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. But at least Paul was conscious of the lordship. There's something that separates him from everything or anything that you could ever see in the spirit realm. Okay, so we're defining that relationship, that revelation. Some of you say, oh, but I call on Jesus, I call on Jesus, but I don't see results. Because you don't have the revelation of that name. You don't have a revelation and you've not delved into a deeper relationship with that God. All right. Now, back to what I was defining here in Exosia. Remember I said that Exosia is likened to a woman that is submitted under the authority of her husband. Okay? Now, when God sends his word, his word comes with authority. All right? And when that word comes with authority, anything that word turns to is supposed to submit to the instruction of that word, to the command of that word, to the leading of that word, to the glory of that word, to the integrity of that word. The Bible says he does not send out his word and it comes back void. It must achieve in the thing in which he sends it. Somebody will say, and I have confessed, I've spoken this, I've spoken that, but even when I spoke every single apostle, I didn't see the answer. Well, you have not yet understood how the word works and how the things of this world are subjected to the word. It's so powerful when you go beyond your physical mind, this mind you have, your understanding, and then connect to your spirit and understand what I mean when I say that all things are subject to the word of God. In the beginning, when God said, let there be light, there was no way light would not appear. Because light was subject to the integrity 
and the authority of the word. The whole world was created by this word. The whole world. The Bible says by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. How can we have this same word? How can we have this same word and not have the results of this word except we don't have the full revelation and relationship with this word? God wants to drive your spirit to a place where whatsoever you say in his name carries an authority that will baffle everyone around you. God wants the church to be elevated to a place where when we speak a word, when we agree upon touching anything, that thing must be established. It must be established as the glory of God. It must be established. It must be established. When I started to learn these things as a young man, I started to pray that I might have a revelation of his word, a revelation of his word, not just to read it and teach it according to the gifting, but to have a revelation, an intimate relationship with Logos, to connect with Logos in the deepest realm I could ever connect with. So when I study the word, I don't just read it like I just have to read it because I have to preach. The Bible says, actually, the word of God is living. <laughs> it is living. It is alive. Men of God and women of God, the word of God is alive. It is active. It's not inactive. He says, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. There is life in the word of God. When you say in the name of Jesus, there is life to it. And if that life comes and encounters a death, it must resurrect whatever is dead because it, there's a life in it. The word of God is not just some loose thing just floating in the air, just there to comfort and encourage, you know, broken hearts. Believers have raised the way of learning how to live with things. I was watching a man recently on television who has learned to live with pain for 27 years and he has a revelation around it. He has a revelation around it. But when he's preaching about this revelation, he doesn't quote the scriptures. No, he quotes another fellow who lived hundreds of years ago, but with multi-sickness in his body eh? and so some people are praying for the grace to sustain the things they can't change and I'm thinking he said there is nothing impossible with God there is nothing impossible with him why are we even giving an excuse of the things you cannot change what do you mean by the things you cannot change and some of them when they say that they're saying I've been diagnosed with a disease, but after praying for a long time, I realized I might not be able to change this. It might be the disease to kill me. So give me the grace to walk with that disease until the day I die. That's a wrong prayer. That's a very wrong prayer. That's a very wrong prayer. God has told us his will has been revealed. He has made known unto us the mystery of his will through the word. He has told you what divine healing is. He says you were healed by his stripes. He has told you what divine provision is. He says he became poor that you might be rich. How can you say that you're poor by the will of God? How can you say that you are sick by the will of God or that this one won't go away? You know, the earlier proponents of faith, I think because they had a very, you know, lower understanding of faith, that I believe that the church is transposing into higher levels of understanding. And one day I believe, I see a day, where a man will stand in a meeting of 20 or 40,000 people and say, be healed. And every sick person will be healed in that meeting. Every sick person will be healed in that day. That day is not far from us, by the way. It's not far from us, by the way. Because the difference between that time period is very simple. Revelation. Revelation. If we can seek God to that place, so we can understand exosia and the dunamis that we have, the authority that we have by reason of the fact that he has given us his word. His word is now resident in you. He's not something you borrow. No. 
The Bible is clear. We behold like in a mirror the glory of God. That means when you look through the word of God, when you look through scripture, this is you seeing like in a mirror. That means you are indeed the embodiment of the word of God. It's inside you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So when you look through this Bible, when you're reading your Bible, you're actually reading you. Oh, I wish people understand that. You're actually reading you. You're not just say, uh huh, the Bible says you shall cast out, then you get it. I cast out. No. When you open the Bible, you are reading you. Everything in the Word of God is in your spirit. Even if you had not met the written Word, it would still be in your spirit if you had been told about the man called Jesus. For in the earlier days of the Pauls and Peters and Timothys, they did not have the New Testament as it is spelled out for you and I, but they walked a life that is enviable. They lived a life that nobody would deny that the power and the presence of God was evident on their lives. Why? Because they had a relationship and a revelation to that name. When you receive Jesus, it's not just enough to be born again. It's more. He says he wills that all men be saved, comma, and that they might come unto the knowledge of the truth. Not just salvation, comma, but unto the knowledge of the truth. And to a special relationship with this truth. When you cultivate a consciousness in your spirit, that the word of God never fails. And that that word which never fails is inside you. You start to even fear to just speak. You learn to hold your tongue, to refrain your tongue. You learn not just to say things because you appreciate and know the power of those things. You know what those things can do in the spirit. You know what they can create in the spirit. You know their ability in the spirit. You know the consequence. There are things I have said so lightly and they have manifested in my life with such a power beyond I could ever imagine. But I spoke them so lightly. But I'm speaking from a fullness. I'm speaking from an exercised conscience. I'm speaking from an aligned thought. I'm speaking from a positioned heart in the word of God. So there are things I've seen in my life. I've seen that there are things I have said easily, simply, in a very easy way. And these things have come to pass. Why? Because in there, there is a life. And that life is fully expressed in the word. Logos is inside my spirit. And I have a divine expression. When I'm not happy about something, there's something that happens in the spirit realm because I'm a child of God. When things are not going the way I want them to go, according to the word of God, of course, as a child of God, there are things that shift. I've seen things that have grieved my spirit and I've just in sign, God changed them. I could see the hand of God intervene to change a thing because my spirit was grieved. My spirit was grieved. Why? I have understood the authority, the authority, the exousia of Logos and the dunamis thereof, and the dunamis thereof. So this that I read for you in Luke is not just attuned to the Christ. No, it is for every believer. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 2, he speaks of how we commend ourselves to the consciousness of men because we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. He says, but by manifestation of the truth, he says, we are commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That is the rule of the measure with which we reach men across the world. That is the rule of the measure with which we speak into the hearts of men. That even when the man has not understood, there is something in your spirit that is inviting him to seek the understanding of the matter with which you speak. Why? Because the authority under which you speak, the authority in which you speak 
is more than just the ordinary man trying to convince about a God. No, it's a man who knows the God they're speaking about. That's what our generation is looking for. It's not looking for just people who know how to quote scriptures. Yeah, I know many people who know how to quote scriptures, but they are broke as hell and they are sick and, you know, they're like the epitome of everything that's evil. Everything demonic is just surrounding their lives. Everything ugly, everything detestful, everything demonic, everything um, that is of death, everything that is of failure and turmoil is in their lives. Yet they confess scriptures. It's not just enough to confess the scriptures. It's deeper when you start to understand the authority with which you speak. Years ago, many, many years ago, I remember I was at university and um, I was given an opportunity to share in an orphanage. And uh, it was one of my first or second sermons to preach in life. And I remember I opened the Bible and I started to teach and preach. And as I was doing so, there was a matron in this orphanage of these children where there was, it was somewhere in Mukono. And this lady was possessed by devils and they did not know. So as, as I was preaching the gospel, the spirit started manifesting through this woman. And they started screaming and throwing tantrums and jacking and, you know, shaking things. And then the kids that were seated around her ran away and she started shaking vehemently. But I was teaching. I did not speak about any spirit. I was just teaching. But as I was teaching, the devil started manifesting through this woman. All right. And so, you know, I preached and preached and then it became so overwhelming. So I had to walk to her and then I rebuked the spirit in Jesus' name and then it left. And then that for me, it was, oh my God. I was seeing devils manifesting while I was teaching. It was something else. It was something else. So I understood that the words that I speak, they are not just normal words. And since then, my life has been like that. I've been in meetings as I'm speaking, people are filled with the Holy Spirit. As I'm speaking, the sick are getting healed. As I'm speaking, diseases are fleeing. And somebody says, as you were speaking, I had a swelling in my left breast and it disappeared. As I'm speaking, I see the Spirit of God feeling and touching lives. I see men having visitations in the Spirit as I'm teaching. I've seen, you know, uh, devils screaming out as I'm teaching because I've understood the authority that comes through the word that we have inherited in Christ. Now I know that my words are not idle. They have a power to it. Every time I stand before that pulpit on Sunday and Thursday, I'm speaking in two lives. A young man sent me a testimony and uh, he said that he told his father to tune in. The father had a stroke, you know, on the whole side like that. And he says, online as they were watching me preaching, you know, the man's body started getting in line. And as I'm speaking, he's walking 100% healed by the power of God. Why? Because our words have a certain authority. They have a certain authority beyond what you can ever imagine. So I want to charge you today to connect to that authority with which you have in Christ through faith. Believe from today that the words you're speaking have a certain weight to them. Believe from today more than ever before. Of course, you could have known this, some of you, or you could have, you know, had a clue about how this works. But tonight I want to pray with you that your words will take another level of authority. And how have I seen it in my life? I've seen it by the multiple miracles that are happening. I've seen it by how easy certain things have become by a simple confession. I've seen the multiple things that would take me hours to change by prayer. I've seen that now I've entered a realm where I speak simple sentences, simple words, and these words come with enough power to change. I told a story of a lady who was, I think, more than uh, eight years, you know, and I told her, go have children. It was enough for her to conceive. I can imagine the hours and years and weeks of prayer and fasting. But I just told her, no, you go and conceive in the name of Jesus. Haven't we prayed? I told her, it's done. Why? Because my word came with authority. It's not for me only as Apostle Grace. It's for everyone that believes. And there are people watching me right now from today. If you speak in a place where men are possessed by devils, 
they'll manifest out of them before you even address them in the mighty name of Jesus. When you speak in the presence of men that have tumors and have incurable diseases, even before you say a thing, those tumors will leave and those incurable diseases will die in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Men's businesses will change simply because you said one statement. Men's lives will change because you said one statement. Things will shift because you made a statement. Things will start working the way they ought to work, not only in your life, but in your family, in your relationships, in your careers. You'll simply confess words, and those words will come with a certain power to change the things that are unchangeable. Father, I thank you because your word has been sent forth. Your word never fails. Your word never fails. And right now I see an impartation of divine expression in the life of a person right now like has never been seen. And while you're speaking, may devils flee. May diseases flee. May poverty flee. May situations turn around. Even the most hopeless situations will turn around. In the mighty name of Jesus, you'll speak to your ministries as men of God and they'll be aligned. You'll speak to your businesses. In fact, open your mouth right now and speak to whatever you know has been stuck for years. Whatever you know you have prayed over for years and weeks and days and has failed to change. I charge you by God to open your mouth and speak. And there it goes by God in Jesus' name. It is stunning. And may people be amazed and say, wow, what a word coming out of this person, this man, this woman. For with that authority and power comes to change whatever is unchangeable. Whatever is impossible now becomes possible in Jesus' mighty name. We decree and we declare that freedom is ours, that disease leaves this world in the name of Jesus, that coronaviruses are judged in the name of Jesus. COVID is judged. All manner of diseases are judged. If you're watching me or listening in and you have an incurable disease, heal, ulcers, heal. HIV heal, cancer heal in the mighty name of Jesus. Blind eyes see in the mighty name of Jesus. Deaf ears hear in the mighty name of Jesus. Careers, I command you to resurrect in the name of Jesus. Businesses that were dead, I command you to come out of those tombs and walk again and be free in the name of Jesus. Ministries that have been crippled, I decree and I declare that God sends life through in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we've prayed and believed. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. And if you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, I want you to repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight I have heard your word and I receive you in my heart as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.